Good morning, everyone. Would you please take your seats? Good morning, and welcome to the research paper competition presented by Major League Baseball. I'm Mike McInerney, a member of the Sloan research paper team, and I have the pleasure of introducing Kyle Burris, who will be presenting on Eye on the Ball, the relationship between sensorometer abilities and on-field performance in professional sports. Uh, the presentation will be 20 minutes long with five minutes of Q&A. During Q&A, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone over to you. Now please join me in welcoming Kyle Burris. So how many of you were told by a coach growing up, keep your eye on the ball? Or what about, you can't hit what you can't see? These expressions reflect the intuitive understanding that we all have. The vision is important for athletic performance. However, there's little empirical links demonstrating that superior visual ability is associated with superior on-field performance. And so in our study, we aim to answer this question in the context of professional baseball through the Nike performance uh, battery. And so Ted Williams, who's one of the most legendary baseball players of all time, once said that, I think the hardest thing to do in all of sports without question is to hit a baseball. And I wouldn't disagree with him. Baseballs move incredibly fast, almost at the limits of human processing ability. Um, more, moreover, a batter has to make a decision whether to swing or not almost instantly as the ball is leaving the pitcher's hand. Even one of the best batters in all of baseball, and certainly one with the best plate discipline, is Joey Votto. And as you can see here, even he can be fooled by a really good breaking ball. And so as scientists, we have processing models for how humans go and take raw sensory input and transform that into muscular action. All throughout this process, we have feedback loops, and there's also communications to and from operational memory. And so in this vein, we have three main goals related to sports vision research. First of all, we want to determine which aspects of vision are most important for particular sports and activities. This might be sport dependent. And then given these, which abilities are most related to on-field performance, to what extent can these attributes be modified through training? And so if we're able to go and improve these tasks, do those improvements then translate on the field? And so in our talk today, we're going to be addressing primarily the first question. However, at the end of the talk, we'll briefly go over some of the stuff that's being worked on currently in questions two and three. And so in 2011, Nike launched the Nike Spark Performance Program, which was designed to assess and train uh, player visual ability. And an integral part of this program were the Nike Spark sensory stations. And the sensory stations consist of a battery of nine psychometric tasks. So these tasks are all designed to measure differing abilities um, that comprises a player's overall visual ability. So the four on the, uh, top, uh, the four on the top here with the, ha hash the hashtag next to it represent staircase tasks. So these are tasks that are adaptively as difficult as however the player's doing it. So if you get a correct response, it'll get harder. If you have an incorrect response, it'll get easier. So with visual clarity, think about the eye chart that you have. Just how well can you be able to differentiate detail at distance? Contrast sensitivity, how well can you differentiate shades of light and dark? Depth perception is how well you can perceive depth disparities at various differences. Target capture, can you capture small, uh, quick targets in your peripheral vision? Near far quickness, how well can you quickly change between near targets and far targets and identify them? Perception span measures spatial working memory, how well you can be able to recreate complex patterns um, of, of increasing complexity. Eye hand coordination is essentially whack a mole. You'll have like a green dot that pops up and you need to hit it as quickly as possible. And there's a lot of these and you try to figure out how many you can be able to hit in like a 30 second period. Go no go is very similar to eye hand coordination except now there's a response inhibition involved. So now there will be like a green dot and a red dot and you should not be hitting the red dots but you should be hitting the green dots. And hand response time measures how quickly a player can respond to a visual stimulus. To illustrate these tasks further, I turn it over to the Nike marketing team. We 
train muscles, we train speed, we look at the neuromuscular component, we look at how do we maximize strength. But this is just as important. The ability to see and process is key. The sensory station assesses 10 different visual skills that are, that are crucial to human performance. Examples are depth perception, reaction time, eye-hand coordination. Once the assessment is completed, it generates a profile that compares you as an athlete to your peers. It identifies the opportunities that we can go after. The analysis is key. You need to know where you are before we can go on that journey of improvement. We don't want to just give people a program, three sets of 10 bicep curls and bench press. That's not the future of performance training. So for the first time, we have the tools to allow coaches and athletes to really start to quantify that C and process component of sports performance. And so through a data sharing agreement with Nike, we were able to attain access to de-identified um, de database of 3,318 individuals. And of these individuals, over 2,000 of them are collegiate and professional athletes. And this represents a very large sample in the context of the psychomotor uh, task, because it's very rare that you're able to like, measure um, sensory motor abilities of all of these players. Typical studies in college and professional athletes will use like a very small sample size associated with one team. But we have access to this entire database. And so as you can see, we have a large number of college football players, but in particular, we have nearly 400 professional baseball players at various uh, levels of the minor league system, and some of whom are even in the major leagues. So let's take a little bit of a macro view on this particular database. And we find that on average, that uh, the better measures at higher levels for almost all of the tasks. So in general, high schoolers tend to do a little bit better than middle schoolers on these tasks, college better than high school, and professional better than college. For some of the tasks, it's a gradual increase as the level increases. But for others, there's a huge jump between middle school and high school and college and pro, indicating that college is perhaps where a lot of the selection occurs in terms of visual ability. And you might also wonder, is this going to be dependent on sport type? Are some like athletes, say like tennis athletes, better at some attributes than say soccer athletes? And what we found in the answer is that question is yes. So for interceptive sports that involve like hitting things such as tennis and baseball, the players in those sports had better measures of visual sensitivity, such as visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, and depth perception than players of strategic sports. And where strategic sports is like soccer and basketball, where you have to go and know where everyone is on the field at any given time. So like turning our attention back primarily to baseball, we're an interested in the question, of our measures of sensory motor ability associated with on-field performance, and if so, which attributes are most important. Now there's a lot of debate in sabermetric circles. They're constantly coming up with new metrics as to how to best quantify performance. And so we are going to use in this particular study five different metrics of player performance. And we are given season-level uh, season aggregates of at-bat level data. And so we're limited to things such as on-base percentage, walk rate, strikeout rate, slugging percentage, and then for pitchers, fielder independent pitching. And so as you can see, the players in our database range from all different levels of the minor leagues, ranging from rookie baseball all the way to uh, professional ball, and you have all of the minor leaguers in between. Note that most of the players are in rookie ball, but there are several that are in the major leagues as well for both batters and pitchers. And so, in order to go and model the relationship between performance on these particular tasks as measured by Nike and on-field performance, we use a Bayesian hierarchical latent variable model. And so this is sort of like the graphical design of what's going on. So on the right here, we have a player's season on base percentage. And I'm presenting on base percentage um, just kind of as an example, but we do a very similar approach for all five of our response variables. And so someone's season on base percentage is going to be a noisy measurement of their true probability of reaching base. So even if I'm a true 300 uh, on base percentage hitter, in 10 at bats, I might get reach base zero times. And that can just happen by chance alone. And so we want to incorporate that uncertainty with this first layer uh, of the model on the right. Lots of things go into uh, a player's true probability of reaching base. And we parse those out into two main categories. First of all, you have the player's true ability to reach base. And then you have the inherent difficulty of the league. 
So if you take an average professional baseball player and you stick them in a single A ball, they're probably going to do a whole lot better than, you, than if you put them into Major League Baseball. And so we want our model to be able to account for that. So that way we don't think that rookie league players are all-stars just because they're putting up some insane numbers. And then within the context of player on base ability, we parse those out into two different um, things. We have their performance on this um, Nike visual motor tasks, and then we have control variables such as age and position and so forth. And we're interested in figuring out, do the uh, variables that comprise the Nike task scores, do they add predictive power above and beyond these other factors for player on base ability? And then if so, which of these uh, attributes um, do? And so this fr how we're going to be estimating this model is in two stages. So we're first going to do stage one, which involves all players, not just the ones in our sample, but all players who played in multiple leagues. And so we assume that a player ability within a year is constant. And so any difference in their performance in, say, AA and AAA is going to generally be due to the difficulty of the league. So then we can go and estimate this model and then have a really good understanding as to what the difficulty of the league is and that the interaction between the difficulty of the league and player ability. And then once we estimate this, we'll use this as a prior for another model, which is stage two. And so in that model, we are then trying to estimate the relationship between sensory motor ability and player on base ability, holding constant these other factors. And so we're going to introduce a little bit of math notation, but I promise you it won't be too bad. Um, so on the very first equation on the right, we have that the number of times that a player reaches base is binomially distributed, um, with the sample size being the number of on-base opportunities that they had, and p sub ij being the probability that player i reaches base in league j. Then we want to go and uh, model the probability that the player I reaches base in league J. And we say that the logit of that is normally distributed um, based on some league-wide intercept and the interaction between the league uh, slope and the um, player's latent ability. And then for our first stage, we assume a standard normal prior on each player's latent ability. So we can be able to go and learn these things. And so what we find is just estimating this model that, as you would expect, the players that are playing in the major leagues have like higher estimated ability than, say, those that are playing in rookie ball. And so taking a look at our posteriors, we actually have a little bit of a league difficulty summary here. So these are posterior means. There are uncertainty associated with them. And our uncertainty is going to just reflect the inherent amount of noise in our sample sizes within each particular league. What we find sort of just trying to interpret this chart that, for example, a 358 on base percentage in rookie ball corresponds to an estimated 292 on base percentage in major leagues. Or if a player has a um, 351 FIP in single A baseball, and uh, FIP is fielder independent pitching, then that would correspond to a 4.279 FIP in uh, major league baseball. And so then we go and estimate this model at stage two using the results from the previous model as a prior for this. And so our model formulation looks exactly the same, but now rather than being a sub i is distributed normal 0, 1, we have that it's equal to x sub i transpose beta. And x is a design matrix that includes their Nike Spark task scores, and we're excluding no-go because we found that that was very highly related with eye-hand coordination. And then we're also including control variables such as the player's age, because there's some natural survivorship bias in the uh, um, in professional baseball, and then also the position that they played. So catchers are probably not going to be nearly as good at, uh, on base percentage as, say, like a typical outfielder. And so our results were robust to covariate transformations. I mean, we have, uh, we did decide to model age as linear, linear, so like your ability is going to get better like the older you get. Obviously, that's not going to be the case. There's definitely an age curve that goes on, and we've experimented with age curves, and we found that our results were, uh, robust to any transformations or age curves that we use, so we decided to present this particular model for simplicity. And so how do we go and select between a full model that includes age and position and all of the sensory motor task scores versus just a reduced model with age and position? We use a metric called WAIC, which is a model selection criteria developed for Bayesian models. And asymptotically, it's a roughly equivalent to leave one out cross-validation. So what it does is it says, how good are your predictions? But then it adds a complexity parameter, um, adds a penalty for the complexity of your given model. 
And so as you add more parameters, your variance is going to be increasing, and so it adds a complexity for that variance. And so lower values, because this is on the deviance scale, indicate better model fit. So this is a summary of our results for the, uh, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll go back a slide. I forgot to explain this. So for on base percentage, walk rate and strikeout rate, we find that the full model adds predictive power above and beyond the reduced model. But we don't find uh, such a thing for slugging percentage or fielder independent pitching. And so this indicates that performance on these tasks are more related to measures of batter plate discipline, which makes sense. Batters have to be able to quickly determine whether or not a pitch is going to be in the strike zone and whether or not they should swing at it and also the pitch type that's going on. And so visual ability might be very important for that kind of thing. And so then going and taking a look at the actual tasks that are related to um, on, on base percentage walk rate and strikeout rate, we find a general positive result. So there are many tasks that are, most, that are highly related to um, on base percentage walk rate and strikeout rate. Our main driver is actually perception span. So perception span of all of the tasks had the highest relationship with on-field performance. And one way that I've interpreted perception span is it measures spatial working memory or ability to uh, like recreate patterns of increasing complexity. So there's this thing in baseball called the third time, or the times through the order phenomenon. It's that as a batter goes up the second time or third time, they do better against a particular pitcher than they did the first time. So our uh, a working theory is that batters are able to see a player's rep, a pitcher's repertoire the first time they, re, uh, they go to bat. And then the second or third time they come up, those with higher perception spans are able to then go and more easily remember the types of pitches that they saw previously, leading to greater amounts of plate discipline on base, in a pro greater probability of reaching base. And so let's go and interpret our results in context of our overall research goals. So we helped answer this first question as to which aspects of vision are important for particular sports of activities. And so just going back to like specific effect sizes, in context, like it's not going to be huge, but it's not going to be small. So we would say like a one standard deviation increase in perception span would correspond to about an eight point increase in on base percentage. So maybe going from 292 to 300. You might see also a um, increase in 1% of your walk rate and maybe a decrease of one to 2% strikeout rate. That's sort of the order of magnitudes of effects that we're looking at here, although we shouldn't be important. It's important to know that these are not causal effects. These are merely associational relationships that we found. And we also want to um, uh, talk about how these attributes can be modified through training. So some of the work that our lab has done with these particular sensory stations is we've gone and tested players over a period of sessions as they are training on these tasks. And we found that some of them could be improved and some of them couldn't. So in particular, near far quickness, perception span, eye-hand coordination, reaction time, those were all uh, tasks that were very relevant in predicting um, the response variables that we considered. And lastly, does vision training translate into improved on-field performance? That's an important open question, and we're not going to be able to get experimental data. You can't just separate a lot of players into an experimental and control group and these types of things. And so we're working on uh, using uh, methods for in causal inference to sort of try to answer this third question. And there's been a lot of effort in trying to figure out how to best train these other abilities like visual clarity and contrast sensitivity and stroboscopic training, Ultimize and NeuroTracker are some of the technologies that have been introduced to try to go and do that. So in, in the future, we're going to be doing this in the context of the Duke Sports Vision Center, which was launched last year. And we're going to be testing next generation assessment and training technology. And one of these new technologies is the synaptic sensory stations. So you can think of this as like the Nike sensory stations 2.0. And we would also really like to take this new uh, data with the synaptic sensory stations and map that to pitch level performance data. So under the data sharing agreement that we had, we only had season level aggregates of at bat level data. But what if we could delve a little bit further into pitch level data? Then we could start asking really cool questions like, are players with worse reaction times, do they struggle with high velocity fastballs? Do, pit, uh, do players with lower perception spans, do they have difficulty recognizing curveballs on two strike counts? All of those in, uh, questions and more would be open uh, to analysis if we're able to go and obtain pitch level performance data. And so we've been 
an active discussion with major league teams as to whether we can be able to get these measurements with these new synaptic uh, sensory stations, as well as pitch level performance data. And then within this uh, pitch level performance data, we've also been working on plate discipline embeddings. So batters have individual tendencies associated with their plate discipline. So some are a little bit more aggressive than others. Some really like to swing at like high fastball. Some are, do not like to swing on low and outside pitches. And so if we're sort of able to go and map these uh, players to like a specific vector, let's just say, we can be able to understand a lot more of like how players are similar to each other in plate discipline wise. And then also how, uh, Player, uh, players are going to be able to, be, their plate discipline is going to be related to their vision. So we could answer this in a much more uh, informative way. And I just want to thank our sponsors and thank the audience for uh, um, listening. If there's any questions, please raise your hand. We'll bring a mic over. Excellent talk. Um, I just saw your last slide there, and you listed Army and DARPA. Um, I'm curious how the vision is being um, looked at in terms of the DOD. Uh, I'm with the Air Force as well, but uh, this is a sports conference, but how are you using those types of analytics uh, and understanding to help the, the DOD as well? Right, so I'm not actively involved on that project, but other people in the Duke Sports Vision Center are, and so my collaborator Greg is down there, and so um, he'd be more than happy to talk to you about some of the cool projects that are being done there. So from a training perspective, um, do you have any sense of it, if it's better to train on this than taking more pitches from a batter's perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really good point because you might imagine that if you see a bunch of pitches, you're going to be able to recognize those pitches a lot more in a game context. And so that sort of relates to the third question that we were talking about, like, does training on these tasks correspond to on-field performance? And if that's true, then you also have to go and take a step back and compare it with other methods of training and do those methods of training translate into on, uh, improved on-field performance. And it's then player development staff and... Uh, uh, people can be able to then go and synthesize these results to come up with uh, player-specific uh, training interventions. Thank you for uh, the presentation. I think you did a great job. Uh, my question is, if you see the direct correlation between improved eyesight and uh, performance on the field, why more Major League Baseball players would not uh, choose to wear eyewear or um, sports goggles or stuff like that. Right, so I think you're like talking about like how, like how clearly can I be able to see at a difference. And so that's related to visual acuity. So we didn't necessarily find that visual acuity in particular was related to on-field performance. We found that a lot of the uh, you know, cognition tasks that involved a lot more motor skills, that those were the ones that were more related. But we actually have seen, you know, in other work, a difference between batters and pitchers in terms of visual acuity. So we find that batters can, in general, be able to see more, uh, more clearly than pitchers um, at the professional level. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, everybody thank Kyle.